Hello, I'm Stephen Roy Goodman, host of Higher Education Today, a production of the University of the District of Columbia. Welcome back to your education program, the program that connects you to contemporary issues, people, institutions, and organizations involved in the business of higher education in our nation and the world. Today, we'll be talking about how to prepare for various health careers. My guests are two experts who, in different ways, specialize in access to medical education. Dr. Yolanda Haywood is a dean, medical doctor, and professor at the George Washington University. She has written 11 papers in reference medical journals and was awarded the Humanism in, Medi in Medicine Award by George Washington School of Medicine and Health Sciences. Henrine Tobias is the project director for a multidisciplinary health careers website called explorehealthcareers.org. Her Career Explorer site is designed to address workplace shortages in various areas of healthcare. She received her master's in education from Columbia University. Welcome to both of you. Thank, thank you. you. And thanks again for being here. Sure, my pleasure. Well, if I could start with you, Dr. Haywood, um, if you wouldn't mind saying something about your background, because I know that you were a physician assistant before you became uh, a medical doctor. Uh, why did you do it, and, and how was that transition? Uh, okay. Uh, I was born and raised in Washington, D.C., and had the desire to be a physician, but I had three children during college and thought that going to medical school would be way too difficult and learned about a career as a physician's assistant and went to school to become a physician's assistant. I finished that program way back in 1981, and at that time, it, it Physicians didn't know what to do with mid-level practitioners, mm -hmm. and I found the position actually quite frustrating. And at that time, I decided that three kids or not, I was going to medical school. Fair enough. And what was the thing that was frustrating about uh, your I position? I think physicians didn't know, again, what to do with mid-level practitioners. Uh, we were supposed to be able to see all kinds of patients and take care of primary care problems. But physicians hadn't worked with, with physicians' assistants the way they have today. In today's world, everyone knows what a PA is, a physician's assistant. And physicians are very familiar with that scope of practice, and it's a great job. I think if I was doing it today and I was a physician's assistant, I would be perfectly happy. But in the world of 1981, it wasn't even certain that mid-level practitioners like physicians' assistants would survive uh, the health care crisis. So I was concerned about my uh, employability. Fair enough. And speaking of employability, Henry, and if I can ask you, sure. um, I know you run a website called explorehealthcareers.org. Yes. Perhaps in a moment you can explain a little bit more about the site. But one of the things that I am, that from what I've, my research has shown, that your site is very good about taking different segments of the health Feel, the health s sector mm -hmm. and explaining people what they would need to be a doctor, what they would need to be a dentist, what they would need to do to be a, a physician's assistant. Maybe exactly. you could speak to this point if you wouldn't mind. Sure, sure. Explore Health Careers is a free objective resource on over 120 health careers and we include information such as uh, working conditions, academic requirements, scope of practice, and then we also have extensive links to national associations and accrediting bodies to help students, parents, and teachers um, decide what the best career is for them. But let's go back to, let's pretend we were, uh, you know, we were advising or your site mm -hmm. was providing advice to uh, Dr. Haywood back in the day. Um, what would she have found on that site to help her with that transition from being a physician's assistant to a doctor? Well, she um, may have started out reading a description about a physician assistant and the scope of practice, and then there's a little section on there called academic preparation, and it would tell her what kind of courses she would need. Um, but then the message for the website is that you can go as far as you can in your career. So there are many different entry points. People start out as a physician assistant or a nurse and move into um, becoming a physician or other healthcare practitioner. And right now there's a great article on the website um, encouraging high school students to take as many as four years of math and science at that level. And there's a great academic pathways that shows all the different pathways you can take in a particular career. And so we encourage students to go as far as they can in their career, but we provide information on all different levels. And so maybe if we can talk about some of these levels. So mm -hmm. let's say I'm a uh, high school student or a college student, and I'm thinking about possibly entering the medical ar arena in some mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. um, how do I start? I mean, do I just guess, or where do I start in terms of my search? 
Well, um, one part is doing exploration, which is what career, Explore Careers is all about. And that's reading through the material and the information. And then what I suggest when I talk to students is to actually meet with a healthcare professional. Um, do some job shadowing, go to a hospital or a physician or dentist's office, see what they actually do, observe how they spend their day. And then internships are a great opportunity for them to receive additional exposure. Um, then there are many different assessment tests that they can take to determine what health career is best for them. But I often say that it's really up to the individual to choose the best career and just making informed career decisions based on accurate information is really critical. And what happens though if I'm, let's, again, let's pretend uh, we're, you know, we're advising doc, you know, the doctor in the day, mm -hmm, Dr. Haywood mm -hmm. in the day, um, and let's assume that she's got these three kids and I, I assume coming with those three kids come financial responsibility yes. and other things. Is there a way to kind of assess whether or not it's worth the, the money to go to the next rung, as it were, in the medical, are in the medical arena? I think, um, to be honest with you, that's an individual choice that everyone has to make. Um, the farther you go in your education, for example, a, a four-year medical degree or a dental degree, there is more debt incurred through that process. And you have to decide, is this something you really feel passionate about? Do you really uh, want to do this? Um, most often, healthcare professionals can pay back their loans, and there are many different types of support programs to help them do that. Um, so it's an individual choice, and they would have to make that decision themselves. Okay, fair enough. And Dr. Haywood, I assume you did make this decision. I did. <laughs> right. And so did you incur some debt when you uh, Absolutely. went to, and you don't yes. regret it? You do regret it? No regrets at all. I would do it again. And you would advise uh, some students watching this show and pr prospective medical students that it's worth the risk? I would say it's an investment in your career, mm -hmm. if I agree absolutely mm -hmm. with what's been said. If you are passionate about a career and you have done your homework and feel certain that it's a career that you're going to wake up every morning, well, most every morning, mm -hmm. and be happy to go to work, it's absolutely worth it. It's the same investment people make who want to own a franchise. They have to put up, they have to put up money. Fair enough. Well, you mentioned the issue about waking up in the morning. Um, you know, as someone who's not in the medical field, but who's someone who has gone to the doctor from time to time, I often worry as a patient, you know, has the doctor gotten any sleep? Uh -huh. um, and maybe if you could talk a little bit about, you know, how does it, George Washington University Hospital work? I mean, I know there are, there are doctors in training. Uh, do they get sleep? And, and what kind of care does somebody get, does a patient get when they go to George Washington? Okay. Well, if you're going to an academic center where there are trainees, there are different levels of trainees. There are medical students who are, of course, not physicians yet. Mm -hmm. And then there are interns. Interns are, internship is the first year after completion of medical school. Many of us have abandoned the use of the term intern uh, because most of your postgraduate training is just called residency. Right. So some people would say first year resident, that equals internship. So they're medical students and they're residents. Residency training now is very well regulated in terms of duty hours. Uh, residents may not spend more than 80 hours a week working in their training. Now you may say 80 hours doesn't sound like... <laughs> I was about to say 80 hours, really? <laughs> 80 hours sounds like a long time, but uh, when I was training there were no regulations regarding the amount of time that one might spend in the hospital, and most of us remember spending more than 100 hours a week. Uh, in the hospital working. So now there are regulations, 80 hours a week. Also, trainees must have one day off in seven, completely off with no responsibilities for patient care. And you may not work more than 24 consecutive hours. Again, working 24 consecutive hours is a lot of work. And yes, you're tired. But fortunately, now we do have some regulation by the accrediting bodies to ensure that trainees are not working long hours that become dangerous both for themselves and for patients. If you don't mind me pressing you on this point sure, a little bit, absolutely. because, because uh, yeah, that sounds like a lot of hours to me. And so, you know, as a patient or someone who potentially could be a patient. Right. Um, so you're saying that I could potentially see a doctor who's been going for 23 straight hours and who may, uh, who's one hour away from taking that break. 
Is yes, that's true. You you potentially could. It is true. In a in a teaching institution, you could see a trainee who, by the way, is being supervised ah, okay. by an, an attending physician. So it, it your care wouldn't be solely up to someone who's 23 hours into their 24 hours of work. So then there's so essentially there are two medical professionals who are into the, in the room examining me at that point, the, the medical doctor and then the person who is the resident. Correct. And then, but there also might be a, a physician assistant or somebody else there in the room. There may be a physician's assistant or a physician's assistant student or medical student. Um, you may have all of those or nursing student for that matter. So, so there are checks and balances here because there it's not just one person who's coming in to see you. Many checks and balances in the system. And remember, the attending physician uh, is not necessarily the one who may have the answer. We've often had medical students come up with answers right. for our patients. So I think it's a win-win situation. You have trainees who are thinking along with those of us who are supervising. And you advise a lot of students in, in your do. job as a dean. It's true. If, okay, and, and so what are some of the things that, that are concerning the medical students these days who you're chatting with, uh, you know, yeah. behind closed doors? I think their primary concern is how to study the volume of information that's coming at them. Remember, I mean, in 2010, the amount of knowledge that there is around the healthcare field is tremendous. And so the students are burdened with trying to figure out how am I going to learn all of this information. I think that's their primary concern. Secondarily, for the students that I advise, they are trying to figure out where they fit in in terms of their specialty choices. You know, it, 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 should I be a pediatrician or a neurosurgeon? Mm -hmm. And so I think those two concerns take precedence in their minds. And will they talk to you privately about this, or will they, or will they go to a site, uh, you they, know, like we're talking about today? They will do both. There are sites where they can uh, inquire about all different aspects of different specialties. They come and talk to me and my colleagues about uh, specialties. We, of course, do specialty fairs and uh, have physi physicians from all different specialties come and talk with our students. So they have plenty of opportunities. Yet, I think it is a very difficult choice for them. And to, and, and to play off that choice, which I, I, you know, I could see how that is a tough choice for them, but Henry, if you could speak mm -hmm. to the issue of, let's assume I'm a medical student, I'm now going through these choices, I've got to juggle, if I'm, not, if I'm understanding this correctly, the, the, uh, how much risk I'm going to take in terms of being successful in that medical career, how much work I want to put into it, what my pay is going to be, what my likely pay is going to be, and, how much, uh, and whether or not I'm even going to be good at it. Um, and how do you advise people about that? Well, I think that those kinds of decisions should be made uh, before you actually enter medical school. <laughs> I think it's a process that begins very early on, and uh, the more exposure you have to the field, the more people you talk to in the field, um, the better your informed decision will be. Um, as to you know, whether you're going to be good at it, um, you, it takes a lot of hard work. And um, there is a system in place to make sure you're good at it because lives are at stake. Right. Um, so, you know, it really begins very early in the exploration process. Well, what are some of those rewards, though, that, mm -hmm. that you get? I mean, we know how hard it is, but mm -hmm. what are some of the rewards uh, for going through? And I know on your site you've got you know, dozens and dozens and dozens of careers. What are, if you don't mind picking two or three of them and, and maybe talking about what you think are some of the rewards, as someone watching this today would say, huh, I never thought about that. That would be an interesting career. I'd be interested in, in maybe exploring that. And here are the rewards that I would get in that career. Well, actually, the top three most frequently searched careers on our site are nursing, public health, and uh, physician assistant, actually. Um, and nursing is a wonderful career to go into, and there are severe shortages, as you know, in the profession. Um, it's an opportunity for students to give back, um, in many cases to have job security, um, to provide community service, um, to save a life. And so it's, it's enormously rewarding on a personal level. And many of the students I work with also want to um, be seen as a role model mm -hmm. and they want to give back as a mentor. So they want to go back to their own communities mm -hmm. and their parents and family members become proud of them. 